Hello, welcome to the Friday, April 24, 2020 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Yesterday I mentioned that OpenSSL released an update fixing one denial of service vulnerability, CVE 2020-1967. While the vulnerability isn't really all that noteworthy, I find it's after all just a denial of service vulnerability. What's sort of interesting is a little bit the backstory that was now released about this vulnerability and how it was found. Developers are not only sort of releasing code faster as sort of part of this DevOps movement, but also are trying to sort of integrate more and more security tools into the development process. And open source software is certainly not falling behind here. The GNU C compiler, also known as GCC, is including in its latest version, version 10, a static code analysis tool in the compiler itself. So the compiler can warn you about any potential security problems. And apparently this new feature in GCC did lead to the discovery of this vulnerability in OpenSSL. I think it's so far also interesting that OpenSSL, of course, over the last few years, has gotten a lot of attention, so it has been audited, has been run through some tools like this. So nice to see how this new tool in GCC immediately led to discovery of a new flaw and of course also to fixing the new flaw. And IBM patched a critical vulnerability in its Spectrum Protect server. This is a fairly sort of massive complex enterprise backup system. And the vulnerability, a stack-based buffer overflow can lead to arbitrary remote code execution and has been assigned a CBSS score of 9.8, which is almost as high as it goes. So if you're running uh, this software, this server, uh, please make sure that you patch it. Now, typically this is sort of at the core of the enterprise. There's nothing that should ever really be exposed. Uh, but of course, uh, being responsible for all the backups uh, within a company, there is a, a lot of data that an attacker would have access to if they can compromise uh, this server. And apparently there are some reports, Bleeping Computer is uh, summarizing them, that the latest cumulative security update from Microsoft, that's knowledge base 45499951, does cause various issues from blue screens of death to freezing of streaming videos. A little bit surprised that it took kind of so long for uh, this to become really a topic. Usually uh, we hear about uh, these kind of issues within a couple of days. So I don't think it's very widespread. At this point, there doesn't really appear to be sort of a root cause, like there's something that's common to systems that suffer these issues. If you have experienced any problems like this, uh, please uh, let us know. And uh, yes, uh, that's uh, basically what you're looking for. Uh, if you have these crashes, it is, that's knowledge base article 4549951. And you may want to undo this. Uh, now, the article itself does not mention any problems so far. Typically, Microsoft is actually pretty quick in sort of adding notes uh, with uh, certain counterindications uh, to uh, their knowledge base articles if a certain update fails. A common problem with computer hardware in general is that uh, computers contain a number of different electric oscillators and are essentially emitting electromagnetic radiation. Now, back in the old days, talking about like 80s and such, this was widely abused to, for example, detect radiation emissions from monitors, the good old CRTs and spies sort of used large antennas uh, to detect what's the displayed inside buildings on monitors. Now, manufacturers, of course, try to shield their equipment to prevent some of these issues, not just because of the spying, but because, of course, uh, this can also cause interference and disrupt some other electronics or transmissions. Well, it turns out that modern GPUs actually act almost like a radio. And uh, someone at Duo Security went through the fun to actually design a little uh, radio 
around a GPU a card that was able to transmit signals for about 50 feet. So about far enough to, for example, reach outside of a building. This could potentially be used, of course, as a side channel sort of uh, for air gapped devices. I really see it more as a curiosity and a nice little experiment. And red teaming has sort of uh, become a much more sophisticated thing than it used to be. Back in the days, uh, red teaming was pretty much just pen testing. Now, what red teaming really means these days is what sometimes also called adversary emulation, where you're trying to, to emulate certain techniques that an adversary would be using. And you're not just looking for flaws in software and such, but you're also testing detection techniques and the teams that actually try to figure out if you're being attacked. In order to support this activity, there are a number of commercial and also open source products available now. And JB at the Red Canary blog uh, has uh, written a pretty nice summary of some of the different technologies and tools here. Atomic Red Team from Red Canary, of course, is in here. So maybe a little bit biased towards them, but I actually really like the way it was written and compared. Miter's Caldera and, and then also the Hunter Forge's Mordor, uh, which is an open source a free tool and actually compares quite well here. What I particular like is, and, and that's sort of a part of this adversary emulation is that they usually follow the MITRE attack matrix. And what JB did here is to use the MITRE attack navigator to really show how these different tools cover different parts of the MITRE attack matrix. So a Pretty neat uh, blog if you are in this space. If you're wondering what tools are out there and what will work for you, uh, then certainly worth a read, in particular if you're looking for something to read and, of course, play with, uh, then with the tools over the weekend. Well, that is it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.